It was an issue that affected everybody, but it also affected us on a societal scale. And we therefore looked at it in two different contexts as a society. First of all, you had government regulations and policies and investments, sometimes in partnership with industry, to clean up the lakes and rivers and air that we lived in and breathed in. But it also, what we really saw was individual level change in behavior. Kids today know to recycle. That doesn't mean they do it every time, but they know that it's important to recycle. They know that they have to turn off the lights when they leave a room. That doesn't mean that my four children always do that, but they know that. And they're environmentally conscious in a way we never were when we were growing up. They're, away, they're aware of water shortages and turning off the water. They're aware of protecting the natural environment, and they, in an individual way, can change. And that's how the environmental grew, environmental movement grew, on a broad societal scale, but also on individual behavior, and fundamentally about young people learning to modify their behaviors in positive ways. Today, we must have that same kind of movement around the ethical and cultural environment that media is defining for our children. And we must insist, I believe, on accountability from all aspects of our society, whether it is our government, our industry, from parents, and from young people themselves. Ultimately, we have to put the interests of kids first in this area because we're at an extraordinary time in their lives. I think we have the chance as citizens in this country, as parents first, but as citizens and educators and members of this community, to shape an extraordinary new positive reality for our kids. And it's time for each of us, I think, to start by first and foremost educating ourselves about the media. It's hard to do a good job of parenting or teaching if you're not familiar with the subject that you have to educate the kid about in the first place. So all of us, in one way or another, have to do our homework. The upsides are huge. The potential downsides of not doing that homework and of not taking stock of what this new media reality presents, the downsides themselves are scary. And at the end of the day, it's our kids and all kids who will either be the biggest winners in this new transformed media reality or the biggest losers. And that change is really up to us. Those are the ends of my prepared remarks, but because this is a time of both Passover and Easter, there's a prayer that I love to read that I think will summarize all this even though it may not speak specifically to media, but I think it frames it in the light of the kids who all of this really will affect in the long run. And it's written by a journalist from Nashville, Tennessee, and it's simply entitled, A Prayer for Children. So at this moment in the year, it's something that I think reminds me about why we care about these issues in the first place. So here's A Prayer for Children by Ina Hughes. We pray for children who sneak popsicles before supper who erase holes in math workbooks, who throw tantrums in the grocery store and pick at their food, who like ghost stories, and who can never find their shoes. And we pray for those who stare at photographers behind barbed wire, who can't bound down the street in a new pair of sneakers, who are born in places we wouldn't be caught dead in, who never go to the circus, who live in an X-rated world, we pray for children who sleep with a dog and bury the goldfish, who bring us sticky kisses and fistfuls of dandelions, who get visits from the tooth fairy, who hug us in a hurry and forget their lunch money before school. And we pray for those who never get dessert, who have no safe blanket to drag behind them, who watch their parents watch them die, who can't find any bread to steal, who don't have any rooms to clean up, whose pictures aren't on anybody's dresser, whose monsters are real. We pray for children who spend all their allowance before Tuesday, who shove dirty clothes under the bed and never rinse out the bathtub, who don't like to be kissed in front of the carpool, who squirm in church or temple and scream into the phone, the cell phone, whose tears we sometimes laugh at and whose, uh, and whose smiles can make us cry. And we also pray for those whose nightmares come in the daytime, who will eat anything, who never see a dentist, who aren't spoiled by anybody, who go to bed hungry and cry themselves to sleep, who live and move but have no being. We pray for children who want to be carried and for those who must, for those we never give up on 
and for those who don't get a second chance, for those whom we smother, and for those who will grab the hand of anybody kind enough to offer it. Well, that's a great poem, and I would say, at this transformational moment, on all the levels we're talking about, it's time that we grab the hands of children here in Cleveland and around the country and make sure they have a better future. Thank you very much. Yeah, I didn't know if I was going to do it. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing that poem with us. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're listening to James Steyer, founder and CEO of Common Sense Media. We'll return to Jim in a minute for our traditional City Club questions. We encourage you in the meantime to formulate your questions for our speaker now and remind you to keep them brief and to the point. I always believe the more questions, the better during the session. We welcome all of you here and those listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country that broadcast the City Club. Radio broadcasts are made possible through the generous support of Case Western Reserve University. Our television broadcast partners are WVIZ PBS Idea Stream and Time Warner Cable. Television broadcasts are supported by National City, now a part of PNC, and Cleveland State University. Closed captioning is provided and supported by Nordson Corporation, and our live webcasts are supported by the University of Akron. On Friday, April 17th, the City Club will host Ambassador Charles Dunbar, Professor of International Relations at Boston University and former Director of the Cleveland Council on World Affairs. Monday, April 20th, the City Club will convene a panel of Cleveland's young leaders, including April Boise, Randell McShepard, Chris Renane, and Beju Shah. If you wish reservations, order a CD or DVD of today's program, please call 1-888-223-6786 or 216-621-0082. We're pleased to welcome to today, to our forum, students who are here as part of our City Club student program. Particip participation of these students is made possible by a generous contribution to the City Club from the First Energy Foundation. With us today are students from the Cleveland School of Science and Medicine. Will our student guests please stand and be recognized? <laughs> nice to have you here. Come back again soon. Today's forum is the annual Samuel O. Friedlander Memorial Forum on Free Speech. Mr. Friedlander was an active member of the City Club for most of his adult life and served as our president in 1962. Dr. Friedlander was a great proponent of free speech and issue-oriented community involvement. We deeply appreciate this level of support and encourage you to make a contribution to our endowment. With us today at our head table is Nina Gibbons, daughter of Samuel O. Friedlander. Ms. Gibbons, please stand and be recognized for your support. Okay, now we'd like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club questions and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today are City Club Director of Development, Marcella Brown, and Director of Development, Jessica Leary Allen. Jim, would you come back Absolutely. now for our first question? Great. Over there, yep. Mr. Steyer, you spoke about the uh, new chairman of the Federal Communications Commission who's just been appointed by President Obama. Right. Uh, presumably, he shares uh, uh, President Obama's uh, values in many areas. Uh, what changes would you like to see him make uh, in the FCC from what it's been? And what is the likelihood that uh, if Congress is involved, it would uphold those changes? That's a, that's a great question. So, they, they, and everyone who knows the question is what, what changes do we, we would like to see at the FCC and what will we expect given some of the other political reality? So, Julius Janikowski, actually, I should confess to this audience, is a founding board member of Common Sense Media and one of the people who actually helped to start the organization. 